Hey there, everyone. I'm Shannon Weston. I'm a gynecologic oncologist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I'm coming to you live from ASCO 2020, virtually from my living room, um, to talk to you a little bit about some of the exciting findings and, and some of the highlights of what we saw at this 2020 meeting. Um, the ASCO 2020 was, the theme was Unite and Conquer, Accelerating Progress Together. And although we weren't really able to be united in person, um, I think it was a really exciting time for us um, in the field of gynecologic cancers. And we saw really practice changing results um, along in all of our different cancers, not just ovarian and uterine cancer, but also cervical cancer and some more rare tumors like like gestational trophoblastic disease. So I want to spend just the next few minutes um, talking to you about some of the highlights uh, that caught my eye and also remind you to check out some of the other great videos from some of the distillants from ASCO 2020 talking about the research in more detail. Um, you know, from gynecologic cancers, I think, you know, ovarian cancer has definitely dominated ASCO, no, ASCO meetings over the last few years, and, and certainly ASCO 2020 was no exception. Arguably, the most exciting data that were presented were from Dr. Poveda and colleagues that updated the results from SOLO2. Um, you all will remember that that is a randomized control trial in patients with BRCA mutant ovarian cancer that had had response to a platinum-based therapy and then were randomized to a lab rib maintenance versus placebo. And patients were continued on that maintenance until progression. Um, and what Dr. Povedo and his colleagues presented was the overall survival data. Because all we've seen from all these different PARP inhibitor, inhibitor maintenance studies was a benefit in progression-free survival. And of course, we wanted to know if that would yield overall survival benefit, especially since many of these patients will get PARP later and perhaps as a treatment. And what they found was a greater than 12-month difference in overall survival in those patients that were treated with PARP inhibitor maintenance, a laparid maintenance, um, after response to therapy. Despite the uh, 30 to 40 percent of patients that went on to receive a PARP inhibitor later um, in their treatment. So this indicates to us that sequencing does matter and that we can see an overall survival benefit even if patients get the treatment later. And so that's certainly very exciting. Now there are toxicities um, that need to be d discussed and there was a, a higher proportion of patients that developed MDS or AML. And so we really need to, to process those data and understand what that means for our patients going forward. Um, Dr. Liu and colleagues also looked at the next steps for PARP inhibitors, which is really looking at combination therapy. And she's previously presented her work looking at elaborate and sidereinib in ovarian cancer and demonstrated lovely response rates as well as improvement in progression-free survival over, say, PARP alone. Um, so this trial was designed to compare uh, the combination of elaborate and sidereinib to elaborate alone um, and to platinum-based therapy. Unfortunately, the trial did not meet its primary endpoint, which was to improve progression-free survival over chemotherapy. However, it did show similar clinical outcomes with response rates and progression-free survival to chemotherapy. So the question now remains is, can we consider a PARP combination in lieu of um, a platinum-based therapy? There was a little pun I didn't even intend. Um, so I think those are some of the exciting data around PARP. But it wasn't just all about PARP, this, this ASCO 2020, and we saw some really interesting um, research around other novel agents. You know, certainly um, the updated pembrolizumab results presented by Dr. Matrilonis and Klein colleagues were important. Um, I think that we weren't surprised to see the continued modest response rate of about eight to nine percent in unselected ovarian cancer patients and and single agent pembrolizumab, even with um, when looking at PDL one positivity, really didn't seem to have much much impact. But in the subset analyses in the far plot that she presented, there was a really nice response in those patients that had clear cell histology, about 21%. Um, so that's really exciting and indicates that perhaps for this rare tumor, we're finding something that might be um, of interest. And then um, we saw some really lovely data presented by Gilbert and colleagues around mervituximab. Now this is a, an agent that is a, an antibody drug conjugate that targets folate receptor alpha. And I think we've seen a lot of data around that drug presented over the last um, few years, some positive and some not so positive. Um, this study was combining mervituximab with bevacizumab in a very a, a better selected group of patients where they really had to have either folate receptor expression two plus or three plus. So really true high um, folate receptor alpha expression 
um, group of patients, and they found an impressive response rate. Over 60% of patients had response, and upwards of 90% of patients had some clinical benefit, certainly much more than what we would expect with, say, bevacizumab and chemotherapy. Um, now, this is just a, a single-arm trial, so you know we'll need more data around this, but certainly very exciting and very promising work. Now, moving from um, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer also saw some, some really interesting data this uh, particular go around, partic um, or particularly around combinations with immunotherapy. We know single agent immunotherapy works very well in patients that have microsatellite instability, high tumors, but not so great in, in the other patient populations. And we've seen some really lovely data around the combination of pembrolizumab with linvatinib. Well, uh, Dr. Stephanie Leroux presented some interesting data around the combination of nivolumab, a different PD-1 inhibitor, and um, cabozotinib, which is a multi-kinase uh, inhibitor that targets not just VEGF, but also um, CKIT and others. And she demonstrated some really exciting data. Um, in this randomized trial, which compared the combination to uh, nivolumab alone, there was an improvement in progression-free survival as well as a, a nice response rate of about 25%, um, and almost 50% of patients had some clinical benefit. So again, another interesting novel combination um, that may be something we look for in uh, moving forward with endometrial cancer. Um, from the cervical standard, uh, sorry, the cervical cancer standpoint, um, we saw some really nice data around early therapy, adjuvant therapy, um, and uh, and surgical therapy. So the Centacol uh, results were updated and demonstrated a um, no difference in cancer-related oncologic outcomes between groups that had. Uh, sentinel node mapping compared to a full um, pelvic lymphadenectomy. And so certainly that's very reassuring, but please remember that that population is a pretty low risk population. Um, and so we'll be really looking forward to the results of Centacol 3 that look uh, in a more high risk uh, pop population. We also saw some interesting combinations around um, immune checkpoint inhibition with uh, a patinib. Um, and so the, the response rates were much more uh, than we would expect for checkpoint in inhibition alone. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, as that move, moves forward, um, um, where we are. So with that, I would just say, I know we're all really excited for next year's meeting, and I hope that we'll all um, be able to be together in person. Um, but I think that um, overall, we've, we've really come together in our ability to process these uh, virtual meetings, and I look forward to more conversation about these data. Have a good one.